Hi, my name is Curtis Poe, better known to many folks online as Ovid, and I'm here to talk to you today about the programming language Raku. And before I go further, I do want to make one thing clear. This talk is not going to be a tutorial, uh, because if it was a tutorial, there's actually a lot of cool stuff that it might be a little bit difficult to show you. And I want to get to some of the reasons why you might want to use this programming language. Um, but I'm also not going to get into a lot of the advanced features. It's about a bunch of little nice things that is going to make your life better. It's why you would want to choose this language for the day-to-day -day work that you tend to do. Now, Raku was originally announced back uh, around the year 2000, and it was going to be Perl 6. It was going to be the successor to Perl, this little example of Perl that I have up here on my slide right now. Uh, but Raku's not the successor for Perl. We We've known for a long time that it can't be the successor to the language. So it got to the point where it was eventually decided we are going to rename the language. And today it's called Raku to make it clear that it is a separate language from Perl. Um, and we like to call it a sister language. It's related to Perl in the way that, say, C Sharp is related to Java. Um, take that as you will. Uh, some of the concepts between the two languages are similar. If you're familiar with Perl, you'll already be familiar with a lot of the basics of Raku. But many of the things in Raku are cleaned up or approached from a different fashion in the Raku language in order to make them easier to use. But I want to focus on some of the really amazing things about the language that you're going to be using. And there's so many wonderful things about it. Um, the type system is useful for humans, not just computers. That's the one that I'm really going to be paying attention to. The, the OO system for Raku is very powerful, and I absolutely adore it. Um, it's got a working concurrency model, which for dynamic languages, for popular ones, pretty much doesn't exist. Uh, it's got infinite lazy lists, grammar, wonderful Unicode support, metaprogramming, so many things in there, and I'm not even going to go into all of them. I, I can't. I only have uh, so much time for this talk, so I'm just going to cover some of the highlights. But one thing which is um, sometimes confusing for people if they're looking up at Raku online, they might stumble across things like this. This was one of the first examples of Raku I had seen in the wild. Um, this was back when it was still called Pearl 6, and it looks a little confusing. What is this? Well, it's a red-black tree. Uh, who knows what a red black tree is? I'm not going to go into a red black tree right now. And it's the sort of thing where if I have to explain the benefits of this very powerful algorithm, then it's going to take me a while to actually get to the point of explaining why Raku is such a great way of expressing that, why it makes it native or easy, sorry, to express that. Um, and the reason I want to avoid stuff like that is this problem. I have a couple of friends of mine who are race car drivers. And they could explain to you in incredible detail every single nut, every single bolt, every single spring, anything on this, on this image of this engine. They could tell you all about it. And most of us don't care. We just want to be able to drive the car. So that's what I want to focus on. A lot of the examples of Raku that I've seen out there are really great and powerful, but they do require a lot of background. Maybe they require some background in comp side. Maybe they require some background in how the Raku language itself works, so you can show you this little bit extra of the language, which is powerful, and I don't want to go there. I want to show you a few of the basic things which are really powerful and will make your life easier and might make Raku the first choice of language for you instead of just another language which is out there. And we're going to start with math. And I mean basic math. We're going to keep this really simple. There's nothing complicated. Don't be scared just because it's math. 7 divided by 2. What's the answer to that? Don't think about computers. I don't want you to think about computers. I want you to think about an elementary school teacher. If an elementary school teacher asks you, what is 7 divided by 2, what is your answer? Well, she might turn to a student named Ruby and say, Ruby, what is 7 divided by 2? And Ruby says 3. Wrong. Python. This is Python version 2. They fixed that in Python 3. It says 7 divided by 2 is 3. Tickle says it's 3. BC, a, a calculator tool, don't ask. It says that it's 3. So I've written one-liners in a whole bunch of different languages to find out what they think 7 divided by 2 is. And I wrote a one-liner in C. That, that's uh, not actually easy to do. Um, and You'll notice up here that I use percent %f. I'm, 
I want a floating point number out of this. I don't want an integer, but it gives me a zero and a warning. So I go ahead and change that to a decimal. And now C tells me that seven divided by two is three. When you know that it's not, seven divided by two is 3.5. I have had so many software developers argue with me over this because they say, no, integer operand integer gives an integer. That is the way that it is supposed to be. It is what we call integer math. No, the purpose of software is to help humans. It is not to help computers. And I, I don't want people arguing about this. This is so frustrating for me because we are here to solve human problems. If you're trying to solve other computer problems, that's fine. You get low level, you, you want to get down in the weeds, that's, that's okay. But most of the time, I'm writing software for humans, not for computers. So what does Perl say seven divided by two is? It says that it's seven, that is 3.5. Ah, you have a correct answer. Because Perl by default says, we have extra information here. Let's try not to throw that away. So it's kind of doing the right thing. But then what's negative seven divided by two? That's an interesting question. We've got you know, Ruby, Python, Tickle, etc. Now we know Perl's gonna get this right. It's gonna say negative 3.5 because that's the correct answer. So Ruby, Python, and Tickle all say that it's four um, because they're rounding. A BC says that it's minus three. What about C? Well, again, I'm applying my one-liner again, and it says that it's minus three instead of the minus four that all of the others say. And it actually gets to be a little bit more difficult because if you look at the C89 ANSI standard, when integers are divided and the division is inexact, if either operand is negative, the result is implementation defined, which means you can have a perfectly correct program compiled against C89, send it to someone else, and if they have a different compiler, it may not work correctly for them. That is an abomination, even if they're following the same standard. So this has been fixed in the C standard, as I understand. But let's go a little bit further than that. Let's solve for x here. 0.1 plus 0.2 minus 0.3. Well, 0.1 plus 0.2 is 0.3. Minus 0.3 is 0. Therefore, 0 equals 0.1 plus 0.2 minus 0.3. Your math teacher will not flunk you for that. This is an important thing. Remember, we are solving human problems. I don't want to solve computer problems here. I don't care about the computer's problems. The computer's having a bad day, so what? I'm trying to solve things for you. And that's why I think this simple, simple equation is so important. What does Perl think this version of zero is? Perl, 0.1 plus 0.2 minus 0.3 is a very, very small number. Hmm, that's not zero though. So what do, what's division by zero? Well, according to Perl, one divided by zero is 18 quintillion. That's a, what? In fact, if you want to multiply the mass of the sun by zero, you get 110 trillion kilos. That's roughly the size of Mount Everest. So it turns out Mount Everest is a rounding error. We never knew it. Gosh. What do other languages say? They actually all mostly say the same thing. Ruby, Python, Tickle. Uh, BC actually gets this correct for some bizarre reason. I don't know why. Uh, actually, I do. It's buried in their documentation, but I'm not going to touch that right now. What does Raku say? Zero. Okay, is that some kind of trick? Is it rounding things off? Well, actually, one divided by zero in Raku is a division by zero error. It actually worked. Now, okay, many of you who have been programming for a long time, you understand why 0.1 plus 0.2 minus 0.3 doesn't actually work, because we're dealing with something called floating point math, where quite often you have numbers which you can't exactly represent well with floating point numbers, so we get an approximation. So we have times when we have numbers which don't quite match what we're expecting, and we should get errors at times when we well, don't, and that's very frustrating. So this is a problem. This is a serious problem. And accounting systems deal with this all the time with all sorts of clever tricks, which I, I won't go into now.
But how does Raku get away with this? Okay, I want to teach you a little bit about what driving Raku is like. I don't want to point to the engine, but this one time, let's go ahead and look at under the hood. So we type Raku at the command line. That drops us into a REPL, and everything in Raku is an object, kind of like small talk. Some of you might remember that language. So we say point three dot what. What tells us what type of object it is. In this case, it's a rat, which means it's a rational number. So say point three dot numerator, it's three. Say point, point three dot denominator, 10. Ah, that's a numerator denominator, a rational number. That makes sense. Say point three dot new dot Perl. It, that just basically that strips out the data and dumps it into a Perl data structure. Um, and we can see how Raku represents that internally. Uh, or this approximation of pi, 3.14159.27, we can see how that represents it internally. And we can now understand why it gets the calculations exactly correct, because it's dealing with rational numbers and not floating point numbers. And you don't have to worry about it, because it just it works for you. There are times when it cannot deal with a rational number, because you can have various mathematical calculations which do not return a rational number, therefore it's not going to use rats. Uh, sometimes there's tricks you have to use to force it, but for the most part, you can work with rational numbers and know that you're safe, which I think is fantastic. Having math that actually works is lovely. Uh, let's, let's take a little look at uh, functions or subroutines or definitions vary quite a bit for different people. Now, here we have a reciprocal function, uh, one divided by shift. No one would actually write a reciprocal function. That's that's kind of silly, but I'm using it here because it's easy to show. What would that look like in Perl? This is actually valid Raku, but in Perl, oh, oh my. I've got one divided by shift, one divided by shift at underscore one. I, oh, this is horrifying. You can write it all of these different ways. And we're just going to pretend this didn't happen because that's awful. This is one of the problems we have with Perl, which has been such a shame. But we're going to talk about the Fibonacci sequence. And I know a lot of folks don't like the Fibonacci sequence. They argue that it's not actually useful. Um, and that's fine. You can think that. But it's very powerful because it's, it's simple. It's easy to describe. And it often shows many of the problems we have when we're writing recursive functions, that you forget your base case. Uh, you forget to check your arguments. You have a deep recursion blowing your stack. You've got all sorts of problems with uh, the Fibonacci sequence, that recursion that Fibonacci sequence can expose. And we know how to calculate it. I won't belabor that point. Uh, we have we see the series of the numbers being 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, whatever. It's, it's simple. There's nothing complex. So here's a basic function signature in Raku. This is one of the things that we'll see this in many dynamic languages. We've got a signature. We've got the names of them. Uh, we have the variable in the signature. Given nth, when it's 0, we'll return 0. When it's 1, we return 1. The default is Fibonacci nth minus 1 plus Fibonacci nth minus 2. So Fibonacci of 8 is 21. Everyone understands this. This is clear. Now, a few things about this. First of all, the signature, it's very trivial, it's easy. We see this in a lot of dynamic languages. Nothing fancy about it. that yet. We'll get there. Given when is a case statement. So many languages get, get case statements wrong because they have a case statement, and whenever you get to the various conditions, you have a break to break out of the case statement. And that's on almost all of the conditions when you don't want that. Most of the time, you want to evaluate one condition, and that's it. So... Raku actually gets a strike. Given this number, when you can have a continue in there if you wanted to continue evaluating the other conditions that you have. So the default is to make this more natural for the way people will do this. <clears throat> but anyone who's been programming long enough knows that there's a problem with this. We have an infinite loop right now because we can say fib of 3.7 and we're never going to match the case of 0 or 1, which is our default cases, to get us out of this. So that's, that's a problem. What we can do to fix that is we have gradual typing in Raku. I can slap an int on there. Subfib int nth. 
right up here. And now this is going to throw an error. And it's going to throw an error while compiling in this particular case um, because it will see a compile time that passing 3.7 will never work with declared signature int nth. Bravo. That's lovely. In certain cases, you can get compile time type failures with Rocky, and that's absolutely lovely. But it, this still doesn't work because now I can pass in a negative 3, and this is an int. So now this I'm still not going to hit my 0 or 1 base cases. That's another frustration that we have to deal with. How can we deal with this? Remember how I said the type system for Raku is designed so it's easier for humans to use? It's not just a computer thing. So I can have this. This is an instance of the class whatever. I won't go into details. Um, and I like to read where asterisk greater than equal zero. I like to read this as whatever I got. So int nth where whatever I got greater or equal to zero. So now, negative three, I'm going to get a runtime failure. The reason this can't be a compile time failure is because the where, whatever I got, blah, 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 I have code behind that. And we know about the halting problem. The halting problem is fundamentally undecidable. We can't know whether the code to check the constraint will halt or not. So we don't decide that at compile time but we can do it at runtime. So we have a constraint type check. It fails at runtime, protects us from the infinite loop, which is nice. If you don't like that asterisk, well, you can just substitute in a variable name, int nth where nth greater than or equal to zero. The asterisk actually comes in very handy at times because this signature is very cumbersome now, uh, particularly if you had several variables there particularly if you want to share this logic somewhere else. How would you do that? Well, now I can declare a subset of a given type. Subset non-negative int of int where whatever I got greater than zero. And now I've got my own signature declared on the fly, non-negative int. Nth. It's easy to use and I can share it across many different functional signatures. You can create your own types on the fly. It is that simple in Raku. And some of you will be thinking, wait, that's actually an unsigned integer. Well, uint is a subset which is already built into Rockin. So I was just using this as an example to show you how easy it is, but uint is one you've already got. So we will ignore that for now. There's a lot to say about function signatures. I'm not going to go into too much. Uh, they're completely optional. You don't need to use them. Uh, we have basic function signatures where you just mention the variable names. You can assign default values to those variables use named values to those variables. You can have types to your function signatures. You can have constraints added in your function signatures. Signatures in Raku are powerful. They're great and they're dead simple. So here's one which I think is absolutely lovely. This is one which is going to be used all over the place. Subset non-empty string of string where whatever I got character is greater than zero. Remember everything in Raku is an object. So string object has a cars function, which will return the number of characters in there. So we simply assert that we have at least one character in the string. So you can't pass an empty string to this. What if you start to think about it? Now it gets a little bit more interesting. So think about MySQL. MySQL, as a consultant, when I go into companies, I actually kind of like MySQL because developers often use MySQL and they don't enable strict mode which means there are all sorts of bugs in your database and there's a layer of bugs in your code to work around the bugs in your database. And I get paid more money for it. So please keep using MySQL with that strict mode. It helps pay my rent. I really appreciate that. But for those of you who actually care about software quality, if your databases are protecting your software quality, your ORM will be able to because you can do things like this. So in MySQL, if you don't have strict mode on, quite often you'll insert like you know, 30 characters into a field defined as var, var chart 20, and it will truncate it for you. It'll issue a warning, but nobody checks database warnings. I, I, I don't see that in production code. So we could have an ORM do this for you, where my characters are greater than zero or less than 256. So you cannot set your first name property to something outside of those bounds. So I think this is something that 
we are going to see ORMs in the future for Roku, which are going to read the metadata from the data database, and they're going to say, ah, I need to have these sorts of constraints on my data. So before you even hit the database layer, it will blow up at the code layer, which is awesome. But when you start hitting that Fibonacci function around uh, the 25th or the 30th Fibonacci number, you're not going to get a result back anytime soon. It is very slow because of the recursive nature of it, which I'm not going to go into too much now. So we might want to speed up the Fibonacci function. How could we do that? Well, we can declare state variables. These are variables which maintain their value in between function calls. A brilliant tool, very useful. So I call Fibonacci and I have a cache and then I check to see if that number exists in my cache. And unless it exists in the cache, I'm going to put it in the cache and then I'll return that value from the cache. All of a sudden, your Fibonacci function returns like that very quick. Um, there's other ways you can do this. You can rewrite your Fibonacci function to be uh, iterative instead of recursive. So this is less clear. And in fact, um, I gave an earlier version of this talk um, quite some time ago, and no one seemed to catch the fact that uh, my iterative version was wrong, even though one of the things that I was pointing out was the fact that with the iterative version, it's not quite the same. You've got to desk check it carefully to make sure it does what you want it to do. This time, I actually have it right, which is good, because I tested the darn thing. Uh, but it's a frustration. So rewriting it like that, um, I don't want to do that. Um, and if you think about well, what's a Fibonacci sequence? f of 0 is 0, f of 1 is 1, f of n equals f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2. And the core of my given statement pretty much maps to the mathematical definition. That is why recursion is often loved so much because it's easy to express things the way they'd be expressed mathematically. So another thing we could do is there's an experimental feature in Roku right now called cached. It's a trait. I can slap on this function. Subfib is cached. And I don't do anything else. I don't have to manually create a cache and store the data in the cache. It will do it for me. Uh, this is sometimes called memoization in some languages. And now I can easily calculate the 3,000th Fibonacci number. Very easy. What is TauStation.Space? TauStation.Space is a narrative MMORPG that runs in your browser. Uh, it's very accessible and free to play that uh, our company all around the world has been developing and will actually make streams happen. We switched to different companies, sorry. It's, it's very fun. It's for people who love science fiction and love to read, but sometimes the code has been a little bit frustrating. You can, for example, you can travel to uh, a, different air, a different space station. You can travel to a different area in a space station. You can travel to a different star system. And the code used to look kind of like this. Um, if location is a station area, travel to area. Else, if it's a station, travel to station. Else, if it's a star, travel to star. Else, croak, I don't know how to travel to location. What I want is something called multi-method dispatch. And in fact, this comment, my kingdom for MMD, was actually in the original version of this code. Very frustrating. There is another way you could get around this, actually. If we were to use something called roles, which I won't go into right now, you could apply roles to various things and say, this is a movement role. It says, I am able to do this thing. I'm able to travel. So if location does traveling, then location travels to character, but then that becomes object verb syntax instead of subject verb object, and it makes it harder to read. Location travel to character, what does that mean? That's kind of ugly, and I still have to handle this base case of I don't know how to travel to. If I had been able to write this in Raku, this is what I would have. Multi-method travel to stationary, multi-method travel to station, multi-method travel to star. It is clean, it is easy. I don't have to remember my base case, uh, that other case of not matching against this, because the language will take care of this for me. This is a powerful thing that people should appreciate. Multi-methods are great, but they're awesome, and they really simplify things. And the Fibonacci example I showed you early, that benefits from multi-methods. So looking at this, multi-fib zero is zero, multi-fib one uh, is one, multi-fib int, where, where whatever I got, greater than one, 
and it matches. Or I could use the uint subset there. And now I can write out my functions in such a way that they perfectly map to the mathematical definition. So Rocco gives you a lot of freedom of choice about how you want to design your code, how you want to write your code. It gives you a lot of tools to make that very useful. And of course, because we have signatures, we have proper return types in Rocco. So subfoo returns bool, but as you can see here, it's returning a string. Uh, so say yes if foo, and the type check fails, which is great. That's exactly what we wanted wanted it to do, but it, it's failing at runtime, which generally is what's going to happen in a dynamic language. So when we can assert return types, we don't have to worry about whether or not some other func returns a Boolean value. The code is going to protect us for that. We don't have to check to see that it's doing the right thing. And I can make things a little bit more complicated. Um, here's an even int. Uh, that Percent percent is kind of like a specialized modulus. I, I won't go into details. Um, basically, that tells us that that's an even number. So I can guarantee that foo will return an even number, an even integer, or else it will fail at runtime, which is what we wanted to do. We would rather have our code fail on bad data than keep processing and maybe get unexpected results. We want our code to be correct. And one of the biggest sources of bugs that we have in software systems isn't that our algorithms are wrong? It's that the way we pass data back and forth isn't quite what we expected. Raku makes it easier to handle that for a dynamic language. And you can gradually add in these extra layers of protection, even if you don't want to have them on your first prototype. So you've got the benefit of rapid prototyping, and then you've got the benefit of that type safety. Yay! It's not entirely type safety. Um, those of you who are familiar with type theory know that you know, I'm uh, stretching a few things there, but it's the core, which is wonderful, and it stops one of the most common cases of bugs, and it makes it easy to do with types that are good for humans. But let's talk about uh, object-oriented code a little bit. Um, OO code in Roku is just dead simple. So I've got a simple point class with x and y coordinates, uh, method, string. Uh, basically, that will if I try and print out my point class, uh, instead of getting this weird reference or whatever, it will show me my this value when I'm printing it out here. So we can actually see easily, if we want to, we can create stringified representations of our objects. Overload stringification is what we call that. Um, but um, we can do a little bit more. We've got method gist, where anytime we try to print it in whatever context, it'll kind of print that out properly, uh, which my video is overwriting some of that, so you can't see all of that. I do apologize. Uh, here we have set methods, which is uh, an easier way of setting the values. I'm not going to explain what all of these extra punctuation marks are right now. Um, that that one gets a little confusing sometimes. But I can declare these things as rational numbers, which means now I can't set that to a string, which means I can gradually add in types as I need to to make it easier for my code to work correctly. But I can, you know, I, I really don't like the set method. It's kind of ugly. Maybe I want to be able to set my attributes directly. Generally, you don't. You, you like immutable objects, but let's say you need a mutable object for whatever reason. We can declare these as read-write up here. My rat dot x is read write, my y is read write, and now I can do point y equals 17.3, and I get type safety when I assign to it. And now I have a point limit. Maybe it's going to be a rational number, but it's got to be between 10 and negative 10. So now if I try and assign 17.3 to y, it's going to blow up, which is exactly what I want it to do. So it's, it's simple, it's easy. You might ask, why am I having these defaults of zero for the x and the y? Because having zero as a default for a point value that you probably doesn't make sense for a point, uh, you want to be able to specify where the point is. So we can simply say they're required, which means when you construct the object, if you fail to pass in one of the attributes, it will blow up on you, which is exactly what you want. So 
I'm now going to create this point limit of rat where I have negative 10 dot dot 10. That's the range operator. It makes it even simpler for me to create my object. Just a little bit, a lot of that syntactic sugar that we want over and over again in our software systems for common things that we do all the time. And this is actually simple. You'll notice we don't have any code saying if this do that, on this condition do that. Um, this is declarative. All of this, all the way down, is declarative code. How would this look in raw Perl? So in raw Perl, you've got all this ugly stuff to basically mimic this behavior. And because you would have to write all of this extra code, you're going to have bugs. And the more code you have to write, the more bugs you have, which is why I love the declarative nature of Raku. Now, we know Moose is a lot more declarative than raw Perl. So even then, we, yeah, it's getting kind of ugly, but it's not too bad, but it's still kind of ugly. But what would this look like against, say, C++? Uh, wow, that's just, yeah, C++ is not known for brevity. Uh, Java is also not known for brevity. Python does a little bit better, but I have to create a separate class just to mimic the point limit that is dead simple to create in Raku. JavaScript, uh, pretty much the same thing. Um, I've got a bunch of hoops I have to jump through in order to get to this level of simplicity. Ruby, same thing. Um, it's not too bad, but we're still having to write a little bit of a manual code in order to, to mimic some of these things. Uh, Go, I particularly liked Go because I had to shrink the font size in order to get this to fit on the slide. Raku is easy to read. It's easy to write. It is extremely expressive. And that is one of the things I think people need to consider when they are looking at a new programming language. There's so many other things to consider for Raku. Um, but just to cover the basics here, we have math that works. We have very, very powerful function signatures. We have types you can actually use. Um, and when I say types you can actually use, I mean they're for humans. They're not for computers. Uh, well, they are for computers, but because you can write types on the fly yourself and easily share them, you can write types that fit your business needs in a very fine-grained fashion in a way that's kind of hard to do for many other languages. And the object oriented system is it's very powerful. It's very expressive. And the thing that I love about Raku, for so many other programming languages, when I'm talking to people about them, it's like, oh, I, I chose it because of uh, safety, or I chose it because it's easy to write um, iOS code, or I chose it because of feature X, the concurrency. I don't hear that with Raku. What I hear is, I have this problem, it solved it. I had that problem, it solved it. I had that problem, it solved it. It is such a beautiful, powerful, general purpose language that it's absolutely wonderful. And people should be keeping that in mind when they're considering the choice of a new language because it is going to be out there even more and more uh, because it does so much for you. And I wish I had the time to say, go into some of the features such as uh, how the type inference works, uh, the infinite lazy lists, uh, which are just incredibly powerful, uh, the asynchronous code, which, I mean, you don't want to use threads. Threads are just a, a mess. Uh, but the synchrony in many other popular dynamic languages, just, it's broken. Parallelism just doesn't work the way you would hope that it would. Raku makes it simple. But just to sum this up, Raku, it's actually a large programming language. I've not even scratched the surface of it. Um, but Perl, C++, Rust, many other popular programming languages are also extremely large. So don't let the size be daunting because uh, baby Raku is actually very easy to learn. It's very simple. Uh, it's got proper OO. Uh, I haven't even scratched the surface of that. Uh, uh, particularly if you start getting into roles and things like that. There are so many things that it does. Uh, and it's so expressive in its power that it is a programming language that you should really be paying attention to if you do a lot of object-oriented programming. Uh, it's fairly easy to read once you get past the basics, like any programming language uh, with, which does things slightly differently. At first, they're a little bit confusing, but once you get past that, it's simple, partially because it's so concise and expressive. 
Uh, it's safer because it gives you that gradual typing that you want. But the gradual typing isn't from a third party vendor or anything like that. It is baked into the language, which makes it much more flexible. Uh, it's just very powerful. I strongly encourage you to check it out. And if you do want to check it out, here are some of the resources for you. You've got raku.org, which is everything you ever wanted to know about the language, plus a, a heck of a lot you probably didn't want to know. It's tons of stuff out there. The examples that I showed you, um, I use Raku, Raku Brew to install my version of Raku and to make sure that things work locally. So that'll be a very easy way for you to switch between different versions of Raku and always keep up to date with the latest versions. Uh, Andrew Shitov is preparing course Raku.org, uh, which is a free online Raku programming course. Um, he's got the initial stuff out there. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, and it's nice because one of the things about that is you'll start thinking in Raku. One of the problems I've noticed uh, Perl developers have when they go to Raku the first time is they, they, they're they told you're thinking in Perl, not in Raku. Uh, so you need to learn a different way of considering problems. So courseRaku.org is going to help you with that, to think like a Raku programmer. LearnX and YMinutes.com, DocsRaku, that will quickly get you up to speed on a lot of the Raku basics. If you're one of those people who just likes to type in examples, you know, hit return, see if it works, great. Um, it will really get you up to speed on a lot of the basics very quickly. Uh, but of course, LearnX and Y Minutes, it's, it's going to be somewhat limited in what, what it can do, but it's a great start if you want to get a feel for how a lot of it works. If you want to learn more about the language, which is going beyond what you'll see in the documentation, there's Raku Lang on Reddit. Uh, don't go to the Raku subreddit. That's for pottery. Raku Lang is about the programming language. Uh, or you can go out to ircfreenode.net uh, and go to Pound Raku, and you can ask them questions there. One of the things I loved loved about the Raku community when I was preparing this presentation uh, is how helpful they were, how willing they were to answer questions, sometimes dumb questions, and say, this is how you would do that, or this is a better way of doing that. Uh, they're very helpful, they're very supportive, and they're very welcoming to new people, both to the Raku language and to programming in general. So you'll really appreciate that. So I just want to say thank you. I really appreciate the fact that you took the time to watch this and that you're already here at the end. Uh, and if you are online for FOSDEM, I will be taking questions after this and we can chat some more. Okay, can you folks hear me? Yep. Good, good. Okay. <clears throat> Skill off, just to address your question about uh, is it production ready? Um, that's, that's a fascinating question, and it's a very difficult question to answer uh, because I don't know... Um, uh, I, I don't know you. I don't know your background. Um, I do know uh, if you looked at Java when that was released back in the mid '90s, um, it was production ready. It was an enterprise tool. It was something that companies all over the place were adopting because of how powerful it was. This um, write once, run anywhere. That, that was a theory. It mostly kind of worked, um, and. It was about as fast as, you know, a, a turtle on quaaludes. 